from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hey everybody, welcome to the Library of Congress uh, for the start, the official start of the fall season here um, and hopefully the fall season around DC. Um, thanks for coming out. My name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here at the library and I want to welcome you to today's Bagley Wright Lecture on Poetry. Uh, my good friend Joshua Beckman, who is the second fellow uh, participating in the series for us. Uh, is here with us today. He's going to deliver a lecture that is so new, uh, so in development, uh, that he has yet to title it. And in fact, he will title it after he gives it to you today. So I'm sure if you have any good suggestions, he'll be around uh, selling books afterwards. Come up and, and tell him what you think it should be titled. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center here at the Library of Congress. Uh, we are home to the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry. Uh, our new Poet Laureate, Charles Wright, uh, will be giving his opening reading at the Coolidge Auditorium on September 25th, uh, so that should be great. Uh, but we do events like this uh, throughout the season, um, panels, lectures, readings, what have you. Uh, you can read more about the center on our website, www.loc.gov poetry. Uh, on the table outside, we also have these um, pamphlets that explain the Poetry and Literature Center. And we have a sign-up sheet and a listing of highlighted programs that are coming up this fall. So feel free to pick that up and come to more events like this. Um, so uh, the format of today's event, uh, Joshua will speak for around a half hour, and then we're going to have a Q&A session. We have a mic for the Q&A session, which I'm going to pass around, and if you don't mind waiting for me to give you the mic so we can get, it, get uh, your question on our recording. Um, speaking of that, um, if you do participate in the Q&A session, um, you give us future permission for uh, use of the recording. We'll end up putting this up as a webcast. Uh, later on in the year. So um, actually, too, at this point, uh, you can do what I do and turn off any electronic devices that you have that may interfere with the, um, with the event. It, it can sometimes um, come up as interference on our on AV system. The Bagley Wright Lecture Series in Poetry seeks to promote leading poets with the opportunity to explore in depth their own thinking on the subject of poetry and poetics and arrange for the delivery of several lectures that result from these investiga investigations. Uh, so if you want to uh, see the inaugural lecture that uh, Dorothea Lasky gave uh, for this series last fall, you can go uh, check out the webcast on the library's website. Uh, our homepage is www.loc.gov. If you go there and click on the webcast section, uh, you can search for the lecture, which she provocatively titled, The Beast, How Poetry Makes Us Human. So that gives you a sense of, of you know, the benchmark that Joshua needs to reach for his lecture. <laughs> I also want to let you know about a couple of exciting uh, Bagley Wright lectures uh, coming up this fall. Um, uh, in between uh, Thanksgiving and the rest of the holidays on December 11th, you can come here at 1 o'clock and hear Timothy Donnelly uh, give a lecture. And on January 22nd, um, after the holidays, uh, you can look forward to the new year with Terrence Hayes. Um, if you go to our website, uh, on the events section of our website, uh, you can find out more details on both those events. I believe one of them takes place here and one takes place in the Woodall Pavilion across the street. And now on to our featured lecturer. Uh, you can read more about Joshua in our print program, which you all should have gotten outside. Uh, I'd like to say, though, that I've known and loved Joshua for many years. To know him is to realize that it's possible to be hugely generous and serious in equal measure towards poetry and towards all those who write and read it. He is also wise beyond measure and always goes above and beyond in his work to champion the art. Joshua participated in our Literary Birthdays series some years ago, and his comments on Walt Whitman were so moving 
so insightful that we ended up launching a whole online interview series just so we could find the best context for them. If you go to our website, which I mentioned before, you can read uh, his comments on Whitman and read the interview as well. But today you have the pleasure of hearing him explore, imagine, reckon, and especially exclaim in person. Please join me in welcoming Joshua Beckman. So I should say before I start that uh, there was something in your description of the results of my investigation and I realized in the process of working on these lectures that the lectures themselves are the investigation and the results, I don't know what the results will be. I would like to begin by saying a few basic things. I have, over the years, come to believe in the poem, not as a singular entity, precise, refined, and complete in the space of its words on its page, but more an accumulation of the experiences those words encourage, the processes that flow in and out of them, the sonic experiences the interior experiences, the social experiences. But even the actual things keep falling apart. I recognize how more often than not, we encounter the poem as less than or more than singular. Think of the poetic oral traditions around the world for centuries and centuries. Their stories constructing and happening Think of ancient fragments anecdotally kept and written down. Think of the poems in letters and all the private copies shared. Think of the entire practice of translation. Think of Walt Whitman changing his one book and many poems over and over again. Or Emily Dickinson leaving us countless private variants to be considered. And most poems never end up in print at all. Private accumulations of drafts to be gone through or not, but still to exist, variant and real. The recordings, the rememberings, the singular has just fallen apart for me. And beyond feeling this relation to the poem, the author too no longer stands so individually for me, so solidly. Not just those with pseudonyms or heteronyms, not just those collaborators or anonymous authors, not just the recognition of collage and appropriation in all its forms, or even the more obvious and diffuse collaboration that is language, but simply that anything creative or communicative seems necessarily social and everything social is collaborative. Can an artist really function individually, historically or even presently? Who in the life of the artist must we ignore to treat them that way? So my preface is simply to suggest or just wonder about no static poem, no static poet, and yet there are the books, so physical. And I'm going to talk about the individual actualities of books, but before I do, I want to think about where they live. Here, we are in a library, a very special, very public library. This is one of the places. I want to think about the different places books are gathered together for communal support, for mutual aid, there is a particular private library I'm thinking about, and like everything else, I'm bouncing off the other versions to, f to build the space of the one I'm trying to find. In a fit of productivity and fear, I boxed up 150 books, which were in my old apartment in New York, and shipped them ship them when where I would spend where I would spend the summer writing this lecture. I was careful 
and purposefully I worked fast so there would be, when I opened the boxes, the surprising and chaotic energy inherent in libraries, the complexity of each individual book abutting the other, and let myself lean in the direction of excess with the basic thought that I should pack anything I felt confident I would either read in the course of writing uh, any of my lectures or reference in a particular one and resist and resist those very attractive categories of books I always wanted to read. Tristram Shandy, and books that have been very important in the past, and which might easily find their way into lectures if they were hanging around. Nietzsche. <laughs> so six boxes packed carefully of the most present real books to me, then to the post office to send them I went, waited, sent, then shoved off into the street a bit light and joyous bumped into my friend Matt, who, seeing me, took off his earphones and, without saying anything, put them on me. <laughs> it tastes good to her, I heard William Carlos Williams say. It tastes good to her, I repeated out loud, the tangy, playful quality of his voice, and then off on my walk home again, springy. Later, I had finished tidying the apartment, looked around and realized that I had actually sent off every book I was interested in. <laughs> every book I imagined would lead me into this lecture. And then, for the rest of the night, I found myself repeatedly, some bodily impulse, pulled toward some book that wasn't there. And really, I had sent everything away. So let me now step back a moment and say that through a web of strange experience or very common experience, ailment and dislocation, I had come to be removed from my home for some time and for more than two years in a sort of recuperative limbo. And now grabbing things dispersed was planning to spend the season reading and writing. And I don't think any of this would make sense without understanding that the great romantic fantasy of my life for some time has been unpacking my books into a home I could share comfortably with them, which sounds a bit much but is true, as if they contain some expansive region of memory, one that feels the full span of myself and imagination. So being removed from my books was initially exhilarating and challenging. I remember sitting on a mattress in an otherwise empty apartment, listening to some music I had borrowed and looking at some books I had borrowed and arriving at some poems differently there, of looking differently for new things differently. In Ruskin's book on drawing, he berates the indulgent parent who gives the child too many books, so that instead of being forced to find the meaning within, he can sort of browse and gather to his imagination's content, and that a few books, regardless of how good they are, are a better inspiration to the youngster. And there is something to it. One can't help but imagine in this time of excessive transitioning. But I don't tend to feel the confidence of my mind and certainly not my memory. So that having my books is like being located well in my right home or neighborhood or climate. But we should go further back. What is the imagined space of the library? Think about the imagined library which grows from living with books so that, for instance, the presence of books, their actual selves as things, as effort, as recording, as form, as proof, as idea, as expression, etc., that to be a poet, one might write poetry forcefully toward some end, even if that end is not seen, understood, recognized, the force toward, maybe not even a poem, 
But then there they are sometimes, poems or even poetry, pushing themselves toward some, some shared existence, <laughs> say in a book, not even seeing that yet. So to be in that space toward, without the limitations of a goal, one can have in one's mind so many various books that one can hold at times the deep and nuanced possibilities without being able to fix on any one. If only for the sense, the real art, art that has a deep effect on you, is by its nature unfixed, unfixable, so that in you there are these and these and others. You have always selves and forms to be like and among, so that as a poet, the imagined library somehow provides the landscape in which the things of what you make are made. And this feels formal, that one can hold in one's mind these various formal results and have in one no exact expectation. One makes a poem to find out what it will be and the experience of the book is the same. So with all those books sent off, I just started to make the lecture anyway. I was thinking of them on their own or me on my own. I thought of Swift's Battle of the Books and other 18th century conversations between books. Them interacting on the shelves, speaking with each other, introducing each other, berating each other, ancient and modern tomes bickering over the respect or lack of respect one is given or deserves. The moral of the story of all the books beginning to speak to each other is usually that in no case will it result in them getting along. This blamed naturally on the character of the reader, the librarist, on the reader's inherent confusion to have so many different disparate to encourage so many unlikely relationships, or at least encounters, and the ability to unbalance seems at the center of the experience of life with books. The varied, complex beings of each, their capabilities and impulses, the visions and ways each conjure, and the discord seems easily expressed as they all speak in their original tongues all their personal statements and concerns. The talking we know they do when we are there with them, it's why we gather them together to be with us, sure, but to be with each other too. We do it all the time, throw some books in a bag together, or think of the small private library one brings on a trip, not the imagined desert island, but the actual trunk of your car. I think of Joshua Slocum sailing alone around the world in the 1890s and rigging up his ship to keep going so he could go down below deck where he had a handful of books and sat reading Moby Dick. Or the private libraries inside the public ones, those books you return to over years, the Jackson McLow book Steve's been taking out of the Seattle public. He's been the only one taking it out. For 20 years, he moved away and came back and there it was, among the others, private, among the other private few that are his, his library in that one. All the private libraries that exist between people between individuals and are made of the books given to each other and received, each individually present even if forgotten. And of course, the books you have in common, have had in common, will have in common. The books an individual owns and cares for and needs. The poet's library inside the poet's library that gets worn down those few most important books, it's where basically of travel and time, that companion book, that group of companions notched, marked, witnessed, or prepared. 
I think of the painters I know, artists with studios and small shelves in them of poetry and literature, that musician with his one poetry anthology, how capable it was over decades, unfolding in surprise or always returned to, the private libraries of particular spaces, the traders with their little stashes always cycling and transitioning, the books always active, always on their way, in or out, being read. The collectors. For many of the bookish folks I know, there is one talk that comes to mind when trying to write about books or libraries, and that is Walter Benjamin's Unpacking My Library. Benjamin, who in desperate circumstances was kept from his books, his papers, his sense repeatedly of home, in it, he says, to a true collector, the acquisition of an old book is its rebirth. There is the good hands part of it all. That the book is with me, it is in good hands. Its rebirth is capable and with that always present. <coughs> and there is a conversation in it too, something like, you have a wonderful library with thousands and thousands of books. Have you read them all? <laughs> To which the reply is, do you use your fine china every day? And anyone with a big library will have encountered this question before. That answer is charming, and maybe there is some truth in it, but I resist. I want to say, no, do you know a book collector who keeps their books hidden or even discreetly contained? I imagine it is the rare book collector who does not have books in the kitchen and the rare china owner who keeps them anywhere else. So first, I want to say whenever we see a book, a pairing of books, a grouping of books, regardless of how slight our comprehension, our awareness is, we centrally take it in, in with something slight, a bell is rung, and the reverberations, almost imperceptible, echo through our days. So these bells get rung and you vibrate with them, or more purposefully, differently, you feel a magnetic pull. I'm talking now only about the times we are not reading the books. You feel a magnetic pull toward a book so that you might take it off the shelf, look at it, read it a bit, consider it as the book or one of the books you are reading and reject it. Sometimes it has barely come off the shelf. Sometimes you just see it and move towards it and then move away. These constant magnetic pulses are the battery, maybe the motor of the bookish. The possibility with any given book feels magical, entire ways and spells, so that there is something organic and pulsing in them always. One encounters a book and can wonder about how and when it took form. And this lecture is about those books that not having an obvious origin, not having a decided plan to their finish, construct their form over time while the poetry is being made. The question is something like, how does the unknowing poem end up in its book? How does the unwitting poem find its form? And I'm wondering if one of the answers is the library. Interior to the poems are all these various ends they will never meet. Inside them, partially, those objects they did not become. The vibrant qualities of vibrant books are often that which they did not contain. Books as form, as things, can be present in the poet, in the poet's mind as a sort of end space or, cum or culmination or object. They can be basically absent from the poet, who, focused on the particular poem, is not compelled beyond whatever thingness it's got. And then inside the space of the poet, with some unwitting private library, and I imagine further that one of the aspects of such a library is a private cosmos of formal possibility. What are these distant reflective respondents? They feel full of the import of human relation, passion, judgment, responsibility. 
there is some aspect of writing poems that feels like feeling around, like echolocation, and it seems to me that books are made some way the same, making them the experience of bouncing off and away from, towards and away from, various points recognized and solid, and in these bouncings off and away, one finds a trajectory. If that doesn't make sense, maybe it is some kind of constellating, uh, in something in which the solid points are recognized and the space between becomes something like a bear or a ladle. So that while writing the poems, is that a sense of the physicality, the eventual beingness of the place of the poems is present, is to some extent always present, despite the maybe more present fact that none of what's being written at that moment, that, that writing at that moment, that what's happening in the poetry at that moment is not going to end up in that physical space. Because so few such a tiny, tiny percentage of what is made ends up shared with others in the form of a book. But that the form of the book is somehow related to the experience of making throughout, so that the closer to the experience of the book, of making the book, the more maybe the physicality does its thing, repels or attracts, and that the thing that is to become the book that thing that is to be the book becomes, becomes in a way that has been happening all along, not knowingly, but has been present. The physical aspects of the book are present all the time. And my sense here is that the way in which they are present is as the imagined library, that the space of the poems occupy the space that the poems occupy in the moments of writing them, that the poetry occupies in the spans and times of writing are somehow related to that thing that becomes the book by, by way of an internalized gathering of possibilities. And I should say I don't imagine that the central location of poetry is the book at all. The central location of poetry is the world, the human world in which language is shared all sorts of ways. Mallarmé writes, when I see a new publication lying on a garden bench, I love it when the breeze flips through the pages and animates some of the exterior aspects of the book. He says, everything in the world exists to end up in a book. When I think of that cosmos of possibility, I first imagine basic form, all things like size and dimension. The book's poems appear mostly one per page. The book is entirely one single long poem. The book fits in my pocket. The book is too heavy to carry around. The book is slight. I can take a few along. The book is slight. I can take it all the way. The book will fit into what I'm doing. Fragments for lines and waiting. A big book, it's space, spaces, massive, containing words, lots of words, any amount, more or less, or fluctuating tall, thin books around tall, thin poems. Hardy books that hold all various things. Imagine the size of a sheet of paper, any size. And any size paper can have a poem on it. And imagine the books those poems make. So form, I want to get the basics out of the way. They're all sizes and shapes. They're glued or sewn or stapled. They're machine made or hand made or friend made. They're hard or soft or falling apart. They're held together with rubber bands or in bags. They've been rebound to be beautiful or to never break. They're clothed in their dust jackets and pictures or paper cloth bare. I want to get some of those basics in or out of the way because I want to talk about form, but maybe just form as some stabilized moment in process, in the process of poetry. 
So the cosmos this poetry being made relates to is the variety of forms partially recognized. The book that's made for individual people. I made this book for my father. I made this book for my niece, and then she made a book for me. Big, messy books in which are stuffed the exciting junk of the poet, like a filled up tub to be gone through, or the not dissimilar magical cabinet with all the poet's amazing displays. A book that unfolds at times like a map, for bigger pages, an accordion book, a book with handmade paper or handmade ink, handmade letters, potato prints put on the cover, and every other kind of writing in, and every other kind of writing in books. So today, my interest is to th is in thinking about the book and how it exists in spans of time during which poetry is coming to be. And having been so removed from my books, I feel reminded how imaginary they are, how much they exist there or not. I start to remember them. A year, an exact year in the poems of the life of John Clare, a year's poetic journal of John Wieners, typed up by someone else later lost, an entire long day's poem by Bernadette Mayer, the poetic collaborations on a car trip by four friends, a life's work, a life's best work, a life's lost work, Ron Paget's poems I Guess I Wrote, the ones he found but can't remember writing, all gathered together, guiltlessly published, his or no, the oral poems of Anna Nelson Harry, recorded and transcribed before she died, with different versions and pictures of her. The tiny book printed abroad, the books that show their eras and origins, made during the war on thin paper or in communist Russia with hard covers, poems gathered by friends, poems gathered by family, by lovers, by academics, reprints of manuscripts or earlier publications. It sort of showers down, not just all the kinds of books one can write, but the ways around an uncertain act a book might form. And all the world of books, those making energies bounce off of. The enormous book I think of written by the enormous man. The ancient Chinese anthology memorized and used in political debate. The aphorisms that from their books flow into people's lives and conversations. I go through and it feels a bit like a commonplace, maybe a commonplace of form. A commonplace book was to record and refine the ideas, anecdotes, quotations that most forcefully made themselves a part of your life. And in recognizing and recording, you buoyed yourself a kind of conceptual environment and history, or just a kind of supplemental memory. Mine is a kind of library, maybe an actual one. But for the most part, I'm caught away from it, the form's ghost-like being there, and so I see what that ghost-like being there might do. And I wanted to do this, I wanted to do this without them, for, for it to be completely imaginary. But I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it. I went, I went home and I grabbed a few books. This is the uh, this is the book printed on little cards. This is the book that has only one or two <laughs> words on a page. This is a, a book with long lines and long sentences.
this is this is a book that was hand hand printed every every page this is a book the concerns of which are local and private This is a book uh, that was handwritten, and inside of it, and inside of it is a note the author sent me that was also handwritten. This is a book someone gave to someone else for a Christmas present. <laughs> This is a book that the author set the type every day after work, line by line, and later, in the end, noted not only that he had done that, but, the, but that he had had to put all the type away as well. <laughs> this is a book that, when the author decided to give a poetry reading, she read to the individuals individually instead of from a stage or a podium. <laughs> this is a book that presents a performative sound experience for reading and hearing it. This is a book that has the author's face on the cover. <laughs> this is a book that has the author's handwriting on the cover. And I will finish with a book that's been on my mind a lot these days. I've never actually seen it. It's Thomas Gray's copy of Linnaeus's Natural System. I remember reading that Gray had written so little and spent the last 10 years of his life writing in the margins of that book. And at first, it seems like a loss or a waste until you think, these are all the plants and the animals. This entire natural world is what he spent his time responding to. And my friend James told me a sad and beautiful anecdote about Linnaeus, which was that at the end of his life, at the end of his life, he had lost much of his sense and his memory, and he would sit around reading his own book, not knowing who had written it, but enjoying it thoroughly. Okay, thanks. Thank you for that, Joshua. Yes, and you, you've earned your glass of water. And so, <laughs> um, so we'll have just a little Q&A session, but I wanted to start by asking a question um, that was a brilliant, brilliant lecture. Uh, and I'm very interested to find out, though, uh, have you talked a little bit more about the specific ways that um, poetry, the poem, may illustrate uh, or exemplify how um, language works in books and in libraries, how that might, how it might differentiate itself from fiction or from nonfiction. What, what poems do maybe formally um, that connect to the shape that books take, take and the sort of psychic shape that the libraries both actual and, and um, imagine you were discussing take. Okay, I'll try. Um, I think there was a kind of poem that I was thinking about, and that was, that was the, the kind of poem that didn't know where it was going when it started. And I'm not sure, I don't feel, feel confident saying that the other forms, you know, forms of nonfiction or fiction function differently than that, but it seems at least a more common thing to allow oneself um, to kind of open up to a, to a formal space and not, not know where you're going. Um, I imagine you don't start a novel not knowing 
you're writing a novel. Um, whereas you might start a poem n not knowing how long it will be, and it could turn out to be a line or three words, or it could turn out to be 300 pages. So that the experience um, somehow for me, that's, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of poetry I was thinking about. So even within um, how it differentiates from, from other forms, I'm not sure. But then trying to imagine that, that as you're writing in that way, as you're kind of in the process and experience of that, there's maybe some aspect of uh, a public physical form it will take and, um, and that at no, at no given moment do you have to attach to one uh, partially, partially to allow oneself to keep writing. To allow oneself to be inside of it. I don't know if that answers the question. Have you found that to be the case for yourself as you've written a, a great variety of kinds of books and poems? Yes, com completely. And I think that part of this, part of the kind of thinking about this comes out of, um, probably comes out of a, a question which is that the, the books that I've written kind of form and seem very coherent, I think, to, to <laughs> maybe that's a maybe that's a stretch, but it seems somewhat coherent <laughs> to to those who encounter them from the outside, at least maybe as though I had a sense of what was happening and then trying to express that I had no idea what was happening um, and kind of getting the response that it was that no one believed me because it had kind of formed itself in a very particular way. And so I think that for me, at least this investigation that, that all of this is about came out of trying to answer that question privately, which was like, how did this actually happen? And I, I, imagined, I imagined because I was witness to all the waste that being a poet produces, mm -hmm. that there's all of this other stuff that would make it um, uh, a less certain experience. Um, is out of the way once once the book appears, or at least or at least on, at times is is that way. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Let me let me open up to questions you might have. I'll pass along the mic to anyone and everyone who wants to ask a question. Hey, Joshua. Hey. Great. Thank you. Um, so I have a question for you. Do you mean that your Do you mean that you're thinking about the book? as a book when you're writing your poems? Because it's sort of an interesting idea for me as a nonfiction writer that I never thought about, I think about the content, I think about the argument, or I think about the research, but I never think about the book, like what the book is gonna be or what the book needs to be. That seems like sort of a, like that's something that happens after. <laughs> And, but it sounds like you're talking about it as something sort of organic to the process in some way. And I'm wondering if, if that is right and if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah, I think that what I'm, what I'm thinking about is balancing that. Yes, I think about it as being a book all the time. And also, no, I don't really think about it as being a book. And I'll say the first part, all of the writing that happens, happens for me in books. I have a little book, I keep it in my pocket, I write in it, and then I have notebooks and other things. And so first of all, the experience of the original, the, or, the original experience of writing the poems has something to do with, with a book. And, um, and there's, there are other oral experiences that are, that are part of it. But also, I don't, because I don't know, and because I really resist, I don't want to know what the book will look like. I, I think it's similar for me. I, I didn't title the, the lecture. I don't really want to know what it's about until I'm looking back at something. I don't, the second I have a sense of <clears throat> what something will be, I'm kind of disinterested. And so... I've kind of push away whatever whatever strong sense of what the book will be, but know that for myself, the experiences of all these other books are in for me inherent in the act of writing. That there's some aspect of putting ink on paper that brings up constantly 
I mean, I started as a visual artist, and and so for me, the page and the visual aspects of the poem are always uh, always there. So yeah. yeah. Um, I must say that uh, I'm not from America. I'm from the Caribbean. Okay. So I always have to say that. Uh, yeah. Um, but what I like with, your, with what you have done here today is, in essence, the open-endedness of the process of creation, right? The, um, not only even the open-endedness, also <coughs> the sense of, to a certain extent, the chaos of the creative, of the creative process, right? Mm -hmm. That you start out and you're trying to figure out, and then you discipline it, and then you come back to it, and, you know, on and on and on. I think it's a very interesting uh, reading in even a deeper sense, right, is that it reflects, in essence, to a certain extent, um, a larger kind of social historical point where we are at this point in time, right? Mm -hmm. We are at a time with tremendous socioeconomic political changes, right? United States and Europe, yeah, I, I grew up in the Dutch French Caribbean, so I studied in the Netherlands, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I was there, for the foreseeable future, Europe and North America were going to be the most powerful places in the world, right? Mm -hmm. We are at a point now where you can clearly see that's going to come to an end. Right, that's open-ended. So I was wondering if uh, in this process of open-endedness and discovery, if you see this also way of creating as a kind of a way to help uh, move this entire process uh, uh, forward that we are now facing, right? And all of these different questions that we are facing in the creation, in essence, of a kind of a new world, a new global citizenship, you know, global mo uh, nomads, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you. <laughs> Okay, that's a big question. <laughs> I think I can. I think I can respond to it in, in ways that uh, follow out the the. I think the thing that that. I don't know if you can see all the papers sticking out of all the books. That that the process that I've gone through is making this lecture not ten hours long, and one of the things I experienced is. I pulled out each book and I wanted to write about what it, or I wanted to write about what my experience of even remembering it was, things like that. And one of the things I encountered over and over was that almost all of these books are uh, made by small presses, are published by communities and relate to a totally different sense of uh, power. And so there's something to me which I, which wasn't able to fully get into, but something where the a reimagining of what the uh, communities and audiences are, and that being um, interior to the experience of writing the poems, that it not being simply a, um, a single act to write and a secondary act to to uh, publish and put out in the world, but that to actually look back at this way of, of considering um, at least the different, the different people I've been thinking about and the different ways books are made is to also recognize that totally different communities are, are um, creating, creating the work and creating, the, creating themselves uh, at the same time. I'm not sure maybe that answers or responds a little bit to the question. Yeah. I think I'm understanding how you approach your craft in, in writing poetry, mm -hmm. but I read that you're, you also translate. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you shift when, when you're dealing with another person's work? How do you bring, how do you bring your, your own process into that while maintaining loyalty to the other poet? Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. Um, I should say, I should say, and this might, this might, I don't know what this will do, but um, I work as a translator, but I always work with, I often work with the writers, and I always work with at least one other person, a native speaker, usually sometimes a native speaker and the writer, so that the actual experience or my role as a translator is. Uh, 
a collaborative one. And my experience as a as a translator, I view very similar to my to my work as an editor, which is as a listener, as someone who attempts to take in experience and reflect in some fashion what's what's going on there. And I think that I would have a totally different answer, a totally different sense of my responsibility if I ever translated things individually. If I ever uh, on my own translated someone who was no longer alive and then took that work and presented it to a public, I, I'm certain I would have a very different answer. I don't know what it would be. Thank you, Joshua. That was really amazing. Um, I was just, uh, as you're going through the books that you brought, they are formally so all over the place. And, you know, in contemporary poetry, there's things that are all over the place. But there's so many books that are perfect bound between 60 and 100 pages, you know, the same dimensions, all of that. What do you think about that? Should we have more kinds of actual books? <laughs> I. You know, partly, I also should say that the, the books that I brought were somewhat limited by my, um, by how my back's been feeling. Um, I was, I, I grabbed some books, I was like, oh, no way, I will not make it off the train if I have to lug these other things around. So I have a somewhat, I mean, a variety here, but there's a much greater one. And I don't know, answering your question, I wonder if it's true, actually. I wonder if we don't actually have a really great variety of books, but maybe pay attention to a certain group of those. And that to, I think one of the things I, I wanted to consider and want to keep considering is um, things have changed so much in the past 10 years, but in 20, 30 years in terms of printing capability, uh, in terms of design capability, people's, the availability of, uh, of making one's own book has grown in the past 30, 40 years, just drastically. And, um, and I think there are a lot of different kinds of books out there. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that it isn't more a question of uh, what we pay attention to and how and how we do that and what we kind of validate and consider it's um, it seems like as poets that one of one of the things that that I recognize for like for you and for other poets I know that some of the things that have been the most important are very small runs of very interesting books and that it's hard I, it's not hard, but I don't think we necessarily, um, I think that the question is about how do we talk about those when there are a hundred copies and what's important is not that it's precious and special, but that it had some other, that it, that it provoked some other experience or relation. And so, I don't know, I don't know. In a way, Joshua, are you challenging both the kind of idea that only the books that are mass produced by say, the Poets Laureate um, have, have, you know, <laughs> the greatest value or the books that are the most um, precious in terms of design and, and come with the sm small print runs and cost a lot of money. These two different ways of kind of defining value, which are both about, in some ways, money, mm -hmm. um, are not as important as other ways of imagining how we can um, see ourselves as readers and see ourselves as relating to this sort of array of books and what they do for us. Yes, I am. <laughs> and but I'm but <laughs> but what I'm proposing is that it's is that it's already happening. We're just we're just not thinking about it. So that so that you can you know that one of your favorite books is something that someone made for you. But if you are up here and someone says, please tell me about your favorite books, it'd be like, well, my niece made this little, you know, and it just seems ridiculous. And, or, you know, my, my friend made me this book and he stapled it together. Well, that, that something about the, the, the kind of power dynamic is that 
we've taken the process and the experiences out of we really haven't like whenever you talk to a poet the experience and the process and that part of what's happening seems very central and then in certain in certain situations that gets removed and we we kind of have to talk about the finished poems as a particular thing the the exceptional book as a particular thing and it just doesn't it just didn't doesn't ring true to me to the actual experiences and honestly it doesn't ring true to any of the literary histories we do it out of complete need for ease it's it's more it's much easier to remember one person's name from such and such country in such and such century than to recognize that there was a much more uh, diverse and organic thing going on. And I think that it's crazy that we would also do that presently with, you know, knowing lots of people, knowing lots of things get made and witnessing it. But I think that there's an impulse to do that. that you and Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman would have had a good time together. <laughs> and it seems to me that what you're doing is looping back, or she was prophetic and he was prophetic, in the individual unmediated publication, um, which, which is the value of, of these little books that are so special and so author-driven, as opposed to editor intervene. And uh, so, <laughs> I, I hope that... Um, your, your work will, will uh, advance a new interest in those who are interested in the manuscript poems of these two authors, because that's a hot field right now, highly, highly uh, contentious field. <laughs> are we, are we uh, um, uh, just a, a fetishish, you know, is it a fetish to go back to the manuscripts, which, uh, for example, Emily Dickinson preferred, or should we go with the ease of Harvard University? Yeah. So thank you. I think it's great. <laughs> well, on that note, let me uh, first thank Joshua for a, a great, a great uh, lecture, and thank you for all of your questions. Uh, I also want to let you know that Joshua's book. I'll hold it up. Joshua's new book, "The Inside of an Apple," which, um, as you see, is somewhat small. It almost fit in my back pocket. <laughs> uh, doesn't have any images on the front. It has some beautiful paper. Um, has poems with a lot of white space around it. It's actually really fun to talk about poems this way. You know, move around on the page. Uh, it's for sale outside. Uh, you can go buy a copy, have Joshua sign it, um, and then think about what it's like as an object. Share it with friends. You know, make it your own sort of personal private book as part of a public library uh, inside your house or wherever, and um, live your great lives. So anyway, thank you, and uh, hope to see you again soon. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.